Hey, welcome or welcome back to Spellbound. I'm BJ the Book Witch, and today we're going to be talking about book bans, why they happen, when they happen, and what we can do about it. So you're watching an episode of Tabled Content. This is where we talk about books as artifacts within the current discourse. Said differently, we're talking about books as objects within our culture. So this is a video that I've wanted to make for a while, but I've been putting it off for a long time because it sucks to think about. There's a lot of bullshit going on in the world right now, and the fact that I and we continue to live through yet more unprecedented times is not a comforting thought. But this is important. Okay, so what are book bans? Book bans are exactly what they sound like. They're when a group of people get together and decide not to allow certain books to be read. This is more typical within churches or religious communities, and it's more common when the restricted age group is children. When book bans become concerning is when they happen within public institutions. So instead of having churches tossing copies of Harry Potter into a flaming garbage can, you have entire counties carting off books from a public school library. And the purpose of book bans is to remove certain concepts or ideologies from the mainstream. Okay, but what kind of books get banned anyway? And that's where the conversation gets a little bigger. Most often, public book bans, as in removing books from public schools or spaces, have typically, throughout history, targeted liberal content. Recently, however, within what we would call cancel culture, private companies are choosing more and more not to support voices and platforms that promote hate speech. That conversation, however, would require a deeper dive into late-stage capitalism, neo-feudalism, and the generational approach of values-based consumerism brought about by millennials and Gen Z. For the purposes of this video today, we're talking about public book bans because that is what we're facing right now, today. Yeah, so there's been an uptick in book bans within public schools within the past couple of years. Literally just a cursory Google search will tell you what's going on. But these book bans are targeting books on the Holocaust, race, gender inclusivity, and sexual orientation. You know, the really important and intangible aspects between peoples and cultures that have throughout history involved the oppression and or genocide and extermination of these marginalized groups. Schools in Tennessee are removing books about the Holocaust. Schools in Indiana are removing books about gender identity and sexual orientation. And Pick a State is removing books about race without even being able to articulate what critical race theory actually is. Book bans are put in place to remove difference of thought, and in this case, basic inclusivity. And over time, it leads to an indoctrinated, uncultured, and uneducated population. But to these kids, in real time, it makes their world smaller. It closes the door that these books open up to creating rich and inclusive conversations about themselves and how they relate to others around them who are different. To a reader belonging within one of the marginalized groups affected by a book ban, it removes the very simple and affirming message that they are not alone. It also leads to an increase in violence and bullying because these important and inclusive conversations about our differences are not had within a public sphere from a younger age. When does this happen? Or how did we get here? This happens when the worldview of a community or a country becomes polarized and then radicalized. So conversations about what books or ideas are appropriate for a community or the public are some of the most talked about topics at school board meetings or community events. So that's common. That's fine. When it becomes serious is whenever politics get involved. State legislature because then you're no longer talking about the agreed upon values of a community. You're talking about standards of law for the entire state. Educators who are already in woefully short supply are facing prison time if they do not report, report gay or trans kids to their parents or if they have a private conversation about the child's own identity. These are indicators that the body politic is radicalizing and that's alarming. The first thing that radical politicians and their followers do is move to limit the access of information. So consider the massive book burnings in 1940s Germany by the Nazi party, or the Great Firewall of China, or most recently, the ban of Instagram and social media and un uncensored journalism in Russia. This is a red flag. 
In preparation for this video, I read Ella Minnow P by Mark Den. It's a quick read and was pretty fun and whimsical for it being an allegory on censorship. The entire book takes place in the island of Nollop, which is named after the person who's credited with coming up with the sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, which has all of the letters of the alphabet in it. Uh, this sentence is in large letters hanging up in the middle of the town square. And one day, the X falls off the sign. The town council gets together and they decide that this is a divine message from Nollop beyond the grave that they should strike the letter X from their vocabulary entirely, both written and spoken. Every book containing letter X is removed from libraries, etc. One by one, all of the letters fall off because the glue, the glue is old. But as the letters fall off, these letters are also removed from the country's vocabulary. You can't say any words with these letters in it, and they're also removed from the book moving forward. And as the book progresses and as the letters keep falling, the punishments on the citizens for breaking these laws becomes more and more harsh. So yeah, a pretty straightforward allegory for censorship. But the thing about this book that had the biggest impression on me was that it did a really good job of revealing the most insidious aspect of a culture of censorship and conservatism. And that is this, the folly of reasonable people refusing to take the threat of extremism seriously simply because at the beginning it seems so ridiculous. So when the first few letters fell off, letters that were easy to remove, X, Z, Q, and even P, the townspeople didn't take it seriously and they weren't careful with their words. They thought the ordinance was silly and dumb, but they just played along because it was funny. So they even took their punishments for their second defense for saying these letters in conversation or writing them down gladly. And the punishment for second offense was the stocks. And they turned this into a whole ordeal and made afternoon picnics in the town square with family members feeding muffins and fruits to their family members who were in the stocks. But as more letters became banned and the punishments for more and more offenses became more brutal, the townspeople looked around and realized that they had let this go on too far. And they didn't stop it when they had the chance because it was so ridiculous. Like, I'll be honest, it's super easy to make fun of Greg Locke preaching in a tent to a bunch of uneducated lemmings telling them that the devil told him the names of six individual witches within his congregation. It's less funny when those six women are doxxed, harassed, stalked, and violence is potentially committed against them. So my whole point is this. Book bans are not new. But the book bans that are happening right now in America are different because they're taking a top-down approach instead of a bottoms-up approach. So instead of individual communities determining their own conservative values, a la Footloose, you have the typically free speech, anti-cancel culture, small government political party creating state legislatures and laws that affect the entire state as a whole and create an invasive and oppressive environment within public spheres and spaces. So it's important that you know that and that you know what to do about it. So what can we do about it? Simply stay informed and get involved. First, look up your school and public library board. Who's on it? Do they all look like you? Were they appointed or elected? And when are elections? Then if elections are coming up, pay attention to who's running and pay attention to how they use words like censorship, bans, parental rights, or inclusivity. And pay attention to your local school board's meetings. Often they open these meetings up to the public or post a video recording of these meetings online. It can be intimidating at first, but I've learned more about the Orange County Public School Board in the past week than I ever thought I would need to considering I didn't grow up here. Being active, staying informed, and getting involved is necessary. The old adage, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, may be cliche, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. And as readers and book lovers, if we were ever to get motivated to fight for a cause, it would be this one, right? And in the meantime, keep reading. Stay informed so that we can all be advocates for literacy and inclusivity within our own communities. All right, that's it for me. I want to hear from you. What is your favorite banned book? Mine would have to be Mouse by Art Spiegelman. Let me know down below. And for a list of books that have either already been banned in public schools in the past two years or are currently under review or up for debate, I will list those in the description box below or right after this, and I highly encourage you to check them out. Take care, and as always, happy reading.